and all and all other uh, members of the education fraternity and ecosystem uh, and allow them to focus more on things that tech can't do so i think there are two things here first being able to identify what tech should be used for and maybe not ideal to be used for um, and um, further to that uh, allowing tech to free up teachers to do things that tech can't do okay very good anything else thank you any other uh, uh, you know projects or things that come into mind yes, when sir. you when you yeah okay. yeah yeah may i i'm sorry if i interrupted uh, oh, so no, no, no. I think I agree with Vaishnavi. I think uh, edtech is anything that helps or uh, enables education. Uh, of course, helps or uh, lets the teacher make it more easier for the teacher and the student. Any Anything that makes it easier for, that facilitates learning, both for the teacher to teach or to pass on the knowledge and for the student to grasp the knowledge. Uh, now, mostly when I see uh, the market and the the stakeholders, like the parents or the students, if they uh, are asked what edtech is, I have mostly seen that uh, seen uh, people assuming edtech to be digital. So mostly it is digital is what they uh, imagine uh, when when we talk about edtech. So I think edtech uh, spans more than just digital technology. Uh, the infra the school uses, what kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, assessment you're, uh, you're doing. I mean, there can be a lot of applications. So edtech is very broad and I, I think my horizons also widened only after I uh, started my MA. It's terrific. Actually, let's, yeah. So I'm, I'm glad that very quickly we got to, um, ideally what should be saving 15 minutes of my presentation. But knowing me, knowing me, I will, you know, I, I'm sure we'll we'll revisit those those uh, items. But it's very good to hear that uh, both these inputs did not focus on the technology, but focused on what it means for the education. Albeit, you know, you focused on the teachers and you focus on the learners, and I know by implication there is much uh, more uh, involved and. Uh, I mean, the the distinctions that were pointed out, and I really like the fact that, you know, the supporting the teacher, but a particular point that was made by Vaishnavi, but also uh, something that will allows the teacher to focus on those things that the technology cannot do, or, or you know, I would have said it differently, those things that might be important that can be helped by technology, but not necessarily done by technology is another way of thinking about it. this is this is very good when i look at education technology as they say look you know uh, because most technologies as we all know that came into uh, education uh, came in uh, not were not developed for education were developed for things other than education then were adapted adopted etc um, uh, in education and only, uh, th there are a few instances over time, but only recently more and more focused on developing things by education for education. Now, uh, and of course there were things, a lot of uh, packages, software packages, of course, which were first developed for education and then went on to become other things. You know, you, statistical packages, LMSs, et cetera, which became big enterprise applications but they developed a small products in academic institutions. In fact, there was a whole project that I did in a past part called Valuable Viable Software, which was looking at all kinds of software that was, this was uh, in the uh, mid nineties, uh, all kinds of software that were developed in education institutions, you know, uh, which became mega products. Right? Uh, anyway, so the, the thing is, I also like to think about what are the, uh, hard challenges. So if I asked you, looking at you're all educators, you know your context well, you're budding educators or practice experienced educators, 
what are some of the hard problems? And we'll come back to this again. What are some of the gaps that you see uh, in teaching, in learning, in education? Just name one or two that you think can be addressed well, uh, you know, that you think educational technology could. It might not be the answer. What does, forget about the technology or the solution. What are some hard problems, gaps in teaching, learning, education that you see in your context or from your vantage? Any uh, immediate uh, feedback to students in a class where there is like lots of students? Feedback is a challenge. Especially when, I, I guess, immediate feedback when the numbers of students that you're engaging with are large. Yeah. Um, very small group, yeah. Anything else? It's excellent. Um, anything? Hi, uh, any I'm other? Shalini. Uh, I'm a mm -hmm. practitioner. So um, I think one challenge which I see typically is, uh, and, and which is spoken about a lot, is uh, the employability challenge. Whether education is really making um, our graduates employable. Wonderful. What a great uh, Okay, so I mean, I'll, I'll characterize it as relevance, right? So uh, is what I'm learning relevant for this? It's 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 interesting to note the variety from a, a you know what was pointed out when the individual feedback is a very hard micro problem, and then there's a macro thing. And how can you make education, the curriculum, the practice much more relevant to let's say the workforce or employment opportunities and so on? This is this is terrific. So there is. There are some gaps, and I mean, and these two are very important ones for the world that we're talking about. Uh, I also want to make a comment about the earlier thing that um, um, uh, um, I don't know who pointed out. Uh, sort of was it you or somebody who said that edtech is largely viewed as digital, being digital? Uh, yeah, and I mean, what I read that. So you went on mute. Um... Okay, so even the technology is militating against me. I <laughs> think they know so. So, uh, the, you know, the, the point is that, you know, that we quickly jump to uh, the technology when we think about education technology, rather than all the other stuff that you guys said, which is really about education application, looking at it. And uh, I often make this distinction between invention and innovation. And invention being about the technology, the product, et cetera. Innovation being its application, but it has a whole variety. When you move from invention to innovation, suddenly a whole bunch of systemic considerations come into play. As we all know, no? teacher preparation, technology infrastructure, policies, leadership support, all that stuff. So moving from an moving from tech to a tech. I think, you know, really see, requires a shift in the mindset and think, shift in how we think about it, both as individuals and institutions. So that's one big take, you know, for, for me from this. By the way, the other thing that I wanted to quickly say, and this is the, you know, now that Anil has claimed, uh, already hinted at how old I am by talking about 27 years at MIT, but there were 10 more years of, of uh, education technology that preceded it. What I, education technology is not new. It was not suddenly discovered and invented in the, to pick up on Saurav's point, in the world of digital, in the digital world that we live in, right? When I was in school in Delhi, at, uh, you know, at four o'clock in the evening, uh, we used to have television broadcasts of labs, right? Site, the site program was there. And they used to broadcast these labs because there were lots of schools which did not have access to those lab facilities. And I know seeing is not as good as touching. We had labs in our school, but we also I also knew of lots of schools which did not. And it was uh, it was not perfect, but it was great to see those experiments being shown, chemistry experiments, etc. The site program, as you know, was incredibly successful. You know, it was one of the first big large educational programs satellite-based education programs in the world, right? That was education technology. Uh, um, I, I, I should tell you my research work was in 
uh, introducing technological innovations for education in developing countries. So you did a lot of, when you look at the literature, because you'll, you'll be shocked. Radio telesecondaria in, in uh, Mexico was used extensively to teach mathematics over radio, you know, in the old days. So radio was a very, very powerful educational medium for education technology, because education technology used extensively. And even now in India, there are great interactive radio projects. I know EDC had done some projects. So there's a whole range. And then, you know, I look further on when, when uh, you know, when I was doing uh, my uh, graduate work, when I was doing my PhD, microcomputers came in, right? Uh, you're looking at that. I went to work in Maine to, to help uh, developed their interactive telecommunication system, ITFS system, which connected the seven campuses. All these, and now we talk about you know, VR, AI, all these, when I came into MIT, where this very large, remarkable project that you should read about called Project Athena, okay? And it was to have a very large distributed computing environment to support education, right? It became a model for the world. How do you run a very large distributed network in an open but secure way, right? And there were lots of technology behind it, but it was a large scale educational technology deployment. We used uh, something called the Andrew file system from Carnegie Mellon. We had things like Kerberos, et cetera, for security over here, right? And But the whole idea was, how can I have unattended use of computing for education because you can't expect teachers to be everywhere the faculty if you use a piece of software in your class and show it as an application in your class right when the students go to their computing clusters or to the laptops nowadays or to their phones you cannot be around it has to run by itself and you know so those were the early days in fact even things like instant messenger came out of that project because we used to have messaging going on on this network, right? So point, and then of course, all the stuff that's been happening with software, you know, the original old days of computer assisted learning, where we used to design, you know, I used to write, you know, develop, we used to call them courseware, right? And where it used to have particular applications to teach particular topics, or even the early days of intelligent tutoring, where you looked at, uh, you know, tutors to understand the conceptual misunderstandings that students had as they navigated the problem. Right? All that is a tech, hardware, software, dare I say, underwear, everything, the infrastructure, that, you know, everything in between. Right? So it's, I, I'd like you to sort of embrace this generous definition and similarly with digital, you know, of education technology. So what I want to do today is the rest of the thing is sort of, I call it my brief history of the future, right? Say, so, look, this is what I, you know, we engaged with uh, in MIT. These are some of the things, the reasons for, and then move it into some of the considerations, you know, uh, design considerations, if you will, of, of things that are happening today, much of which that you might be familiar with, but it's more fodder for thinking and the conversations. now. I cannot see you, but one of the things that people who have interacted with me know, I interrupt and I like to be interrupted. Okay, so if there's anything, just uh, ask a question. You know, we'll, in, a, in a sort of an orderly way, I've requested Uchita to keep her eyes open in, the sense, in case I cannot pay you to relay your question, right? And uh, uh, so we, we can be reasonably interrupt driven, you know, because, uh, uh, in in this uh, whole session. So, uh, let's see. My question is, why am I not able to uh, move in my uh, slides? Give me a second over here. Oh. This is what one of the reasons why. What I'm going to do, folks, I'm going to stop the share and come back to the share, okay? Uh -huh. So, it should be happening all the time, right? Let me see what more than me.
Okay. Can you see the slide now? Or you can't? Not yet, uh, Vijay. Not yet. Vijay, uh -huh. may I? Uh -huh. Yeah, can you see the slide? Yeah. Do, do yeah. You want it okay. I hope it moves slide now. So, uh, yeah. so, by the way, this is all very, very quickly. Uh, we had this wonderful session about one and a half months ago at. Uh, uh, at your center when we talked about uh, this day of AI and, uh, you know, uh, and this is about bringing AI literacy, a curriculum to bring AI literacy to look at the uh, implications, the applications uh, of AI in K-12 schools, having a curriculum to bring literacy so that you can understand the applications, ethical implications, etc. So this is uh, one thing that happened. This is part of the program called RAISE which actually uh, looks at a variety of tools and bringing into the awareness of, uh, uh, you know, of the teachers and students in thinking about uh, AI in more profound ways. Now, the why I bring this up, and, and then of course, nowadays you look at, you know, even courses like this supply chain uh, course from the supply chain management uh, micromasters, which I'll talk about, where they're starting to look at AI implications for supply chain management. Now, a point to these examples, these are excellent programs which recognize the importance of technology in the workplace, going back to the earlier point about relevance, etc. But I bring this up to say that this, in my mind, is very important. It employs educational technology, but this is not educational technology that I'm talking about. These courses are a reflection of the increasing centrality of digital and technology in the workforce in our lives, right? So the day of AI is to bring AI literacy, but that's not a tech, the way it has been described, helping teachers, helping. the curriculum would be, there are pieces in the curriculum, things like App Inventor that I think uh, Amina is quite familiar with. Uh, so those would be, this, I just to contrast it because to uh, emphasize the point, that the increasing centrality of digital in the world is certainly one thing. The increasing centrality of digital in education for education is what we are concerned about. So just to make that point, and then I'm going to dial back to 27 years. I mean, this is circa 1998. This is when I came to, uh, to uh, MIT. And it's very interesting, you know, you see the range of, uh, of, uh, of projects that were created over here. And, uh, uh, you know, this is uh, uh, 1998 to 2000, maybe 2010, 2011. We launched a whole bunch of technology enabled initiatives that you see. And uh, they, MIT is, has been a very fertile ground for tech innovation. And it's been very aggressive about looking at technologies and saying, you know, how can we, Reimagine teaching, reimagining the classroom, reimagining the learners' experiences using technology. And the projects that you see are ed tech projects. Some of them were driven towards saying, how can I learn some concepts better? Mathlets was introducing Java applets to teach, uh, uh, to teach particular concepts in math, but more importantly, create those applets to, to to exactly what was mentioned to make the connection between the concepts that you're learning and an example in industry, you know, so that you could very quickly introduce the relevance to some applets that were created. That was the purpose actually of those matlets. You had uh, physics interactive video tutorials, Pivot, uh, which was a very famous lecture series on, on the web. Uh, something that I'll talk about, Teal, Project Athena that I mentioned and Open. But there are a whole range of projects, some to teach topics better, some to bring the outside world in into learning, some to create infrastructure. 
and these were all ed tech uh, projects. And there were certain characteristics of this that I'll identify that are very important when, you know, and, uh, and it is not to say that you need to adopt these characteristics, but to think about how you need to thinking be thinking about or how we should be thinking about when we design and adopt and invent educational technology. So one of the big things at that time was, of course, open courseware. And it's the open courseware, its content, is it education technology? And I'm going to say, yes, it was a very big education technology initiative for us, where we said, look, can we create a platform and content which people can use to teach, which people can use to exemplify different kinds of teaching practices that we employ, right? And can we use it as a platform that will supplement, as was said before, teacher education elsewhere, become a model so that people can derive curriculum, et cetera. So this was a very large educational technology initiative. And there's something about this that I want to, uh, uh, there's a story that I tell, which is, I think, uh, uh, important over here. And the story is when we launched open courseware by itself, we looked at as an ed tech platform, but more importantly, it highlighted one important dimension of the internet as an education technology, right? It was saying that, look, you know, you can use the internet to disseminate content, to disseminate practice, to disseminate good teaching practices, et cetera because the internet not just as a distribution model or a communicate model for everybody, but it has specific particular implications for education. And in fact, that's how we arrived at EdTech because, and you've heard me tell this, and some of you might have heard me tell this for this several times, which is when OpenCourseWare was launched, just before that, around that time, there were many institutions which were launching commercial content enterprise, with like, looking at educational content. Fathom was being launched by Columbia, Unix was being launched by Stanford and Michigan. And they're saying, can we take educational content and commercialize it, right? And uh, our leaders at MIT said, look, you know, uh, are we missing the boat? Are we missing the opportunity over here? What do we do with the internet uh, for education? And we had a lot of conversation at MIT. Our faculty talked a lot and said, look, in order to use the internet effectively, we have to for MIT education and through MIT, you have to think about what is the real value proposition of an MIT education. And after much debate, discussion, using words like intensity, et cetera, said, look, the real value proposition of an MIT education is that having a very high bandwidth of interaction between great students and great teachers. We take a lot of effort in recruiting great teachers, a lot of effort in getting great students, okay? We want to maximize the interaction. And at that time, circa 1999, we only knew how to do that in face-to-face -face, on-site interactions. So we said the best thing we can do with the internet is take a picture of all those interactions and put it on the web and share it with the world. That's what we can do with the internet. So which is why open courseware, we all had a disclaimer saying it is not an MIT education, it is a publishing of MIT course content. It is a publishing of MIT experiences. So it had the syllabus, it had the content, it had the assessments, it even had snapshots of, you know, with form of purple permissions, et cetera, snapshots of various discussions, et cetera, because the idea was to say, this is how MIT does it, sharing that extensively freely for educational purposes. And it was very important because it said, these are the things that we value, a high bandwidth of interaction, et cetera, which we only know how to do at that time locally, right? The other initiative, which was much talked about, was this thing called TEAL, Technology Enabled Active Learning. Now, mind, so this was looking at how an introductory physics course, right, could actually, Introductory physics course, which was an electromagnetism course, which is for all of us who have done physics, not an easy course, all fuzzy concepts, right? But it's done. And what happened was 
Here we are having the conversation about how MIT's values, interaction, active learning, etc. And the introductory physics course used to be taught in a lecture theater with 250 students, one instructor somewhere standing way over there and lecturing. And we said, this doesn't die. On the one hand, we are talking about interaction and active learning and all that. And this looks like bad distance learning when there's an instructor standing there and talking to 200 students, right? And this is, but this is an introductory course. You have to teach 250 students at a time. So the whole idea of PEEL was, how do I preserve the efficiency that is needed to teach large numbers of people at a time without compromising what we believe in, which is small group learning, interaction, hands-on active practice. And that was the birth of PEEL. Ideas of it, some of it was borrowed from the studio calculus that was going on in Rensselaer Polytechnic, something's going on in South Carolina. And John Belcher, when he launched it, he said, okay, we'll have this large classroom, students as you see sitting around in tables, right? And then when there are fuzzy concepts, there are very, very profound visualizations that were created at that time in Java to explain those concepts. And the lecturer moves around the tables so the lecture itself is transformed. And there are many implications for the invention to innovation thing I mentioned earlier. Because if in that classroom, you did your old style teaching, PowerPoint by death, the course got killed, right? You had to, the instructor had to change her practice, his practice. The students had to change their practice. They, could, they had to engage. So they would do experiments around the table. They would do computation, et cetera. They would understand that the lecture moved around. So, did not sacrifice your belief in active learning. Remember the open course case, but it said, look, how can I, and these are the kinds of things when I ask you, what is the hard problem, what's the gap? How do I balance the efficacy that is needed to, that we know comes through small group interaction, hands-on experience, uh, with the efficiency that is needed to teach large numbers. So you come up with these solutions that use education technology that has space configurations, et cetera. This is that thing, right? So similarly, at that time, there was a project called, uh, you know, this I actually, when I was uh, advising India's National Knowledge Commission, it was a project to promote it a lot in India. The idea was to say, how can we have remote labs, not virtual labs. These were real virtual labs, we called them, where you could open a browser and run experiments. Okay. You, so we had created an architecture so you could open a browser. For instance, we have a, a benign nuclear reactor in the MIT campus. We had students in Chicago schools, K-12 schools, who could look at these neutrons coming, understand that. And at the same time, we had our engineering students or students in, uh, you know, in other campuses who could run experiments right, with this. So you actually manipulate experiments, right, through this, through the thing. And so much so that these experiments are on simple harmonic motion. There was an, the setup was in Queensland, California. Our students use, use the setup. And there are lots of advantages because in a, in a typical lab, what happens, you go in and uh, once the configuration is set up and used, it, you can't multiplex it. In this kind of a situation, you develop a configuration to many students over many geographical areas could use it. And then there were some other attendant benefits. They could talk with each other, discuss results, et cetera. So it had lots of pedagogical advantages. But the idea was here, the hard problem, if you will, the gap area was, how can I bring this very important lab kind of experiences to remote learners, okay? And, and then you can, uh, and you can mix it up. There were many, uh, uh, virtual lab projects that was subsequently done. But this was, it again, emphasized the fact that we need to think about the fact that hands-on practice, lab practice, real thing is important in our belief system about good education. Similarly, this was a problem, and as you know, this sort of example stuff after this, this was a wonderful project that we did. I'm very proud of it because the group of mine did it. This was, uh, a whole bunch of software that was created, we became part of the introductory biology courses, where again, you could open a browser 
Cornell University had DNA sampled molecules, right, in their uh, protein database. A student could open, grab a molecule, make measurements, manipulate it, you know, and suddenly this whole thing becomes very, very real. Now, some of these things we do with much more facility now. Again, this is uh, the, the late 1990s, early 2000s when we're doing this, right? But this became part of the biology course. So as you're teaching biology concepts, student opens browser, grabs this, does measurements, and they act like researchers. And that speaks to another very important principle that was core to our tech efforts. I talked about active learning. I talked about hands-on learning. And we had to recognize at MIT, now this is not true for everybody, for us, when we were having all this conversation about open courseware, one of the things that our faculty said is, look folks, we are a research institution. We care about research, we do research. So we want to bring the practice, the tools, the joy of research into undergraduate learning. That's how we teach. Right? So can we bring those kinds of researchy orientations into how we teach subjects engage? Right? So this was one of the projects that spoke to that aspiration. And there are programs like Europe as well speak to that. My point is really looking at what are the, some of the things, I call them invariants, that we hold dear in terms of quality education and to make sure as we design these new technologies, new affordances, bring other people in, that we think about what we want to keep, not just what we want to do away with and what we want to change. So that, that was the thing. And again, this is to summarize. We said, look, if we are applying education technology. We want to move away from these are the things. These are the design considerations for us, for all these projects that I showed you. I could draw a line between every project there and to some of these principles. These were the things that we said we wanted to do. In some cases, how can we really we have a, you know, think about small group interactions? How can we move away from large passive lectures, especially the GIRs are the general institute requirements, those introductory courses that everybody has to do. How can we facilitate the hands-on learning? How can we share, create a platform to share our learning with other teachers, etc.? We think it's very important to collaborate institutionally. So all the EdTech initiatives that we launched, some on our own team, some on partnerships with places like Microsoft Research or other alumni grants, etc were all directed towards these kinds of things. You know, you see a whole bunch of the initiatives okay, that were there and in, that we supported funded for education technology at the Institute, okay? And again, these are the core values that I talked about, interaction, research. We don't look at these as separate activities. They have to combine. So we really have to drill down so one, I'll make a macro statement. This is important and will come up. One of the things I always say that technology, the only persistent benefit that technology brings to any enterprise is the ability to look at how we were doing things in the first place. Suddenly when, you know, somebody mentioned assessment, frequent formative assessment, frequent assessment. How were we doing it before? How were we doing it at all? Suddenly, when you have this thing for instant feedback, it makes you think about, how am I designing the course for feedback? How have I thought about feedback? When you start automating the financial system, the first thing that you do is say, how is the system working? How is the manual system working? Where are the forms moving? Who's signing the forms? Are they needed? You do a process check, right? So these core values, we didn't sit down and say, let's think about the core values. Technology was being developed, innovations were being developed, and we had to launch these initiatives. And we said, whoa, what is this telling us about what we care about, what we believe in? Can we put that down? Okay. What are the things that we really hold dear? Because then the technology problem, education technology problem statement, objective becomes, how can we do what we do better, what we care about better? How can we extend what we care about to audiences 
that we typically don't serve, right? And you're able to frame, think about education technology, education technology initiatives in those ways, right? By the way, all this was going on and in 1998, this was the context. Okay? All kinds of universities. I was telling, uh, sharing this with Uchita yesterday and saying, look, all, all this stuff, you know, this could be today. This is exactly what we're facing today. And that was in 1998. Right? I mean, of course, there's much more, more technology has come. COVID happened. We've had some remarkable new things that have come, but a whole bunch of these situations are still very, very, right? Now, I would, I have spoken quite a bit now. I, I could take a sip of coffee here, but what I'd like to do, I mean, I, I talked about, so I would really like this group for a, take a few minutes to think about, you already mentioned feedback, assessment, uh, you mentioned relevance came up as this. And what are some gap areas, problems that you think about? Okay. What's, what do you think might be an ethic solution? I want also uh, for you to think about, and you'll get a couple of examples at the table, then go on, because you need to get to the next stage of the, of the talk. But I want you to think about how will you know, right, that what, I mean, Amina is very familiar with this term that we use all the time in planning. What is the logic model here? And then what do you know what will you look for? What is the evidence you will look for that will tell you that your solution is consistent with the problem that you have? That you have? And then what, what do you think might be some of the barriers or some of the uh, both challengers and enablers for success of your solution? So this is for the group. And this exercise, I mean, we'll do a couple of examples, but I'd really like you all to take this as uh, as a as a take home, <laughs> okay. think about it. And the, so, what's a big, what's a problem opportunity? What might be a solution in terms of? And it, the solution can be in terms of technology, uh, you know, resource development. Okay. Thank you. Any takers? So I'm not sure how um, relevant this is because this is also um, about how students have access to a lot of technology today. And today um, the technology is predominantly digital. For example, you have a five, six year old uh, telling his grandmother uh, that, uh, you know, uh, I don't need you to teach me. I will look up on the internet and learn things. Mm, so uh, till now we have been defining the curriculum or what is to be learned in a specific manner. So how does, how do we modify all of these things with the advent of um, the amount of technology students have available to them. One thing that comes to mind is there are certain things like there are certain skills, subject process skills and values and attitudes which uh, may not necessarily come by um, technology alone. Um, so um, any uh, yeah, so this is something that comes to mind. How does uh, how do we redefine what learners need to learn and also how they learn it though the I feel like the how they learn it part uh, is often talked about but the what they're going to learn part um, I feel requires some discussion good good so what might you I mean this is a it's a very important problem because it's certainly certainly that got uh, highlighted uh, post-COVID, 
because I said, oh, if people come back to campuses, what is it that we're going to do the campus that's different, that is special, that adds on to? That's one version of that problem. The other thing is, like you pointed out, I come into class and put, 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 the students are checking, using Google, using whatever. So there's a lot of autonomous information seeking, etc. How can we channel that for uh, for the learning for you know, for the learning outcomes that we want? So what might be a solution? Um, so I I had a student in a grade eleven class um, who were, when I asked uh, it the session was about uh, learning how to learn and metacognition and and so on. So uh, the student mentioned that he actively s sought out something that he could not find out from Google. Mm, I believe this was during the COVID times and, and he might have been around 12 years, 13 years old and he was very, very tired of being presented with things for that um, that uh, could be learned uh, online. And he took up skateboarding as a hobby and decided that, okay, this is something that even if I watch videos, I can't really learn just from there. And he was very motivated. So I think that uh, finding that kind of a hook or motivation sure. is one possible um, direction. Nice. I'm interested to hear, uh, hear others though. Yeah, others. Yeah, I, I'd love to, I should come back a very quick comment. Uh, yesterday, uh, was it yesterday, the day before, I was in a panel on generative AI, uh, you know, at MIT, there was a faculty panel, and then there was a student panel, and I was struck by one of the students who talked about how she was using genetic AI to think about, she said, there's chat GPT 3.5 or 4 that we use to generate this same solution. Then she was comparing it with how she was, first of all, trying to understand how it addressed that problem and then how she was. So you talked about metacognition. So using technology to be a reflector to understand how you're going about solving that uh, particular problem. But this larger thing about this is terrific. This is a this is a great one. This is a great one. Any others? So I think there is a uh, huge gap between uh, finding the right educator for oneself. Uh, so there is a I mean the communication between educator and the learner is a is a very uh, typical gap. Uh, so once the learner finds the right teacher or the right educator, learning is enhanced. And I think uh, that is that is possible with edtech. Uh, it might be a lot of communication uh, technology that we are talking about, or uh, different modes of information transmission. Uh, the learners are able to uh, broaden their uh, their their knowledge sources. Uh, that I think is a very interesting thing that EdTech did uh, because the remotest of places is giving rise to brightest of minds uh, after the uh, the internet uh, era. This is the internet uh, era and the consequence of internet era. So that I think is very interesting with EdTech. Uh, but still that is only a part. That is even more interesting that it is only a part of EdTech that we are looking at and we still see that scope, that huge uh, or a very immense scope in uh, enhancing the learning, the process of learning itself. So yeah, I think that was the problem and the solution that I identified. That's terrific, that's terrific. And in fact, yours and Vaishnavi's are uh, interestingly enough connected in a very interesting way. But just to comment in a, a thing, I mean, you hit on something that I hope I will touch on later on, because one of the things when you think about the new landscape is what you pointed to, which is the ecosystem. You know, I mean, you know, we always say it takes a village. Now, the our village okay, has uh, not just technology and content elsewhere, but communities elsewhere, peers elsewhere, like you said, you know, from the remote and this thing. And suddenly your understanding of a subject matter, it's, it's not just a one-to-one -one relationship between just you as the teacher and your learner. It's a many-to-many -many relationship, okay? And you say, look, you know, 
what is it that I can do? And the example that I give, this is actually very good because it is having to rethink what we do. Uh, my God, this is really, uh, uh, because it also, I mean, uh, uh, you know, touches on how we have to really re-examine what we are doing because suddenly we are not the only the only actors in the game, only players in the game. And to Vaishnavi's point, just like you say, okay, how am I going to rethink the curriculum, modify what we teach, right? In light of all these other things, what they can find on their own, what they might find in communities, and perhaps even be more proactive about this. Because right now it happens either by uh, accidentally or, you know, I mean, you find out suddenly you, there was this whole thing called peer-to-peer -peer universities where you took openly available content and the community naturally formed around it to teach it each other, and they uh, identified someone as the facilitator. When uh, Anand did his first course on edX, right? The, you know, uh, initially the uh, assumption was there be there were two teachers, two TAs, and 600 students out there. What they found out very quickly was there were two te teachers, two TAs, and 600 communities out there were teaching each other, solving each other, and some of these, for instance. There were Hispanic communities because they could explain to each other in, in this thing. So your, your ecosystem becomes a thing. And this is a very good design challenge because one of the things that, you know, you're all researchers, educators, you're in a, in a program, a graduate program. This is an important area, I think, to touch on, to have some research perspective on. How do I configure, evaluate this ecosystem-based learning practice that's being generated. You know, can we take a particular course, design an experiment, what would I see? Are the learning outcomes uh, met uh, quicker? Is there a distraction? Because you also have to think, you know, one of the guidelines for learning, when we were designing courseware, we always said, look, it has to be very efficient in terms of the learner's time. Right, so it's nice to say you know alana palana appear to group etc cetera, etc, cetera. but there's only that semester. There's only that much time. The learner also has only that. Especially today, adult learners are coming in. They're coming in, accommodating their jobs while they are learning. How do I make it such a? How do I leverage the ecosystem but very efficiently? You know? could be very excellent. These are these are very good examples and. Is tied together in, in what you both are saying, and I, I really like this example. Is uh, is uh, these examples because what you're really saying is how do we rethink the educational practice? Now I'm also going to say that you can imagine and do, but education is a series of well thought out, low risk and high risk experiments. We have to study it. Part of the I think the difficulty that we have, a challenge that we face is we are trying to extrapolate what we know from situated learning experiences onto the online situation. But that situation is different, okay? You cannot, you have thousands of learners, communities, et cetera, et cetera. The scaffolding, the support that we provide for autonomous online learners out there, you know, is not the same that they have in the classroom in, or in a residential setting. And we really have to rethink about how to make that enterprise successful. Because as you both point out, it's happening, right? It is happening. And if our business is to make sure that more learners get quality learning opportunities, then we have to think about how to support this new breed of learners who are out there. Okay, and this is the point of getting. Okay, so this is this is excellent. And I, this is the, the edtech thinking I'll quickly go. So we, we saw the past, you know, now the present and the future. When I say present, of course, this particular thing, what happened around 2012, and suddenly all these things, edX has been launched, and we suddenly we are looking at a whole bunch of stuff. You know, if you fast forward to 2012, you know, uh, MIT has started, and a lot of the transformation, transformative opportunities have begun to surface. And you know this, you know, you're looking at and looking at technology affordances for education. You know, you start looking at, as you said, frequent formative assessment, 
we'll start looking at visualization, simulations, online assessments. The digital centrality is becoming very, very evident in these courses. And we said, how can we leverage? This became the edtech realm, you know? And you started seeing all these uh, happening over there, a whole bunch of courses, you know? And it was across. It was not just for science courses or engineering courses, visualizing cultures, math courses, foundations of arts and design. All of them were looking at saying, how can I judiciously combine online, on-site? How can I flip, but not flip the same way, right? You, you had different kinds. This is a very interesting project and a point to this visualizing cultures thing, because you know you saw the, the MIT X version that you're looking at your, your screen, but its precursor was something that was even more interesting. And this was an early nineties project where uh, Shigeru Miyagawa, my colleague, my neighbor too. And uh, he, he taught Japanese language and culture and uh, uh, what he said was, you know, they had images in the Hiroshima Museum in Japan. They had images in the Museum of Fine Arts in uh, Boston. And we had created our OKI architecture so that it could grab these images regardless of where they were stored and create a repository that students annotated with their comments, with their critiques, and use that to argue with each other. And the whole idea was to teach language and culture to images. And, to, and one of the interesting stories that, you know, that Shigeru always tells is, uh, which I like to share is Commodore Perry was this guy who used to make a lot of trips to Japan. And, you know, the relationship between the US and Japan has been mixed. There were times when it was very good. There are times when it was terrible, right? And the Japanese people, would draw images of Commodore Perry reflecting the current political or situation with the US. So when times are good, you have all these images of Commodore Perry smiling and looking benevolent and wonderful. And at times when it was bad, Commodore Perry would be drawn as an ogre, you know, ugly looking, mean guy, you know? And, and the, the, the thing was to cast this saying, look, you build these images, and you, then you, it allows you to probe what was going on that made them reflect the same person in different times. You get an understanding of the culture and so on. And at the same time, people use this as a vehicle for learning languages also. So I, I just thought I would, I would share that. But this is interesting. After having tasted this other mixed mode, digitally central mode, look at Shigeru's comment. I don't think I can ever go back to a pure lecture style teaching. So this was beginning to happen. This, uh, of course, uh, was uh, the JPAL course from uh, uh, you know, uh, Esther, who won the Nobel uh, Prize a few years ago for uh, for economics. Uh, this was a very interesting course, and I want to point at tech and why I talked about evidence. Right. So uh, we, uh, Michael Chima, was. Well, this is an introductory chemistry course that was taught. But it was, a, as you pointed, it was a material science solid state chemistry course. And he, it was a very successful MIT X all online course. And we told Michael, how about bringing all those elements into the residential version of the course? Then, which he did, you know, so, all, you know, so there was a whole bunch of online stuff that was going on, uh, everything, you know, uh, there was no homework, no exams, but people actually used to meet physically to do their, uh, quizzes and tests, and if they didn't get it right, they could go study and come back and retake it. So it was actually doing a very blended version. But what was interesting was the ooh, the results that we saw. So if you look at this chart, can you all see this chart uh, clearly? Just say yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. So if you look at the blue lines over here, if you, you know, what you see on the X axis below is many of the concepts, the topics that were covered in the course, right? And the mastery of the concepts, you know, is reflected in the personality of class who mastered the concepts, however they were measured. And if you look at this, the blue line in 2012, prior to the introduction of the blended mode, 
let's say you take atomic structure, about 19% of the students mastered it, okay? In 2013, the green line, okay? You see that 89% of the students mastered the concept with this mixed mode. Now, this was dark evidence which said that, look, there's something interesting going on. When you mix these modalities of online plus on-site and mixed frequent formative assessment, this is the kind of results that you get the remarkable difference. And some of this we can explain, of course, you know, when you have frequent formative testing, et cetera, we know from other uh, things that it does be, uh, lead to increased mastery, but this is very, very telling and it really oriented us very, very well towards, uh, uh, you know, towards looking at, uh, uh, what actually bothers me? Uh, so, and by the way, we all know why all this sudden interest was happening in terms of increasing digital centrality in education, because it was happening in the world outside. We know, you know, that, that you know, transportation was being converted into software industry. Everything that we know about, you know, Uber, uh, the, the ferrying service was now a software service. And so this increasing centrality of things digital, or one of the most telling examples that a colleague of mine gave me, he said this, Vijay, uh, you know, when we studied geography, we looked at atlases and maps, okay, which became a million images on Google Earth. And now that's an intelligent service on my watch, right? But every hard product is getting converted into an intelligent soft service. And that, you know, and that is what does that mean for education, what we teach, what we learn? What does that mean for the trajectory, the increasing digital centrality in teaching, learn, and we have to think about that. That's, that's ed tech. But I also wanted to point out the, the bottom line over here, and Uchita and I got into this conversation because she was mentioning some of you being very interested in adult learners, right? Part of what we were seeing is, look, you have all this stuff, you have to think about new content, new teaching, et cetera, but because the workforce is changing, but there's a whole bunch of new learners, non-traditional learners who are coming into the education space. These are people who are displaced, not just because of social political crises, but who are displaced because either the jobs, the skills requirements are changing, the jobs are changing. So I, I, you know, and then also people who are differently able, suddenly you're realizing that these people come, they need to be upskilled but they don't have math skills, they don't have reading skills, right? So we are beginning to recognize that we have to provide quality learning opportunities to a whole range of different kinds of non-traditional learners. And this is not just about the non-17 year olds. This is people who are geographically displaced, locationally displaced, vocationally displaced, right? And because there was no other way to meet the demands that are being placed on the economy, on industry, on working, on survival, on 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 you know on social mobility. Now, so it, we had to respond to that. And in many cases, and why I have the example on the right, it's a very telling example. Uh, is it's not always a reaction. In many cases, we said that look, the increasing digital cent centrality of technology allows us to do things that we are not able to do well or things that we were ignoring. The right example that you see on the Newport uh, shipbuilding, it's a very interesting example, Newport shipbuilding, you had all these workers who were welding and screwing on plates, right? And, you know, they would screw it in wrong, so the failure rate was high because they did not know how what they were doing affected the production line downstream, right? And also, they would get up, their morale was down because they thought their job was to go and weld this plate every day in, day out, that's what they were doing. What the uh, organization decided to do was outfit all these people with VR glasses, you know, the things, so that they could see. So now when they welded or screwed in a plate, they could see the impact all along the production line. You see, if they misaligned this, made a mistake, what downstream effects it had had, as a result of which they were more careful, they had to be trained in particular ways. The failure rate went really remarkably down 
But in, a more interesting thing happened. The morale of the workers suddenly shot up because, in fact, I think the number that was quoted was an 84% increase because suddenly these people said, our job is not just welding a plate. We are building a ship. We are building a ship that can be an aircraft carrier, that can be an oil tanker. Suddenly their sense of their work to the earlier point about relevance became high. And so in many cases, looking at this technology as what are the things it can do that we're not able to do or do better. And this is a lesson, I, I, and I show that example because it has serious implications for our teaching learning enterprise. So I, I don't know why I'm not able to take. But anyway, so all this was, there are new learners, new contact, et cetera. And this is where I, you know, I'm, I'm approaching the end over here where I said, saying, look, you know, let's look at, uh, you know, it all seems very, very daunting, you know, but not to speak as a technological determinist or an edtech determinist, but, you know, we all know this, we're in this business on the supply side, we have a lot of, affordances, the digital centrality, the what we're learning about learning. And this this is, for me, the ed tech space. And some of these you guys already talked about. The first thing that I say is a very generous definition of ed tech or digital, that it is not just about, you know, hardware, software. It's a much more expansive territory, much more generous definition. But the more important point I want to make is when you look at the learning life cycle, you know, or the various activities in learning, lectures, labs, etc., cetera, uh, you find that every aspect of it is subject to innovation. You know, I'll pause for a second over here. Shuchita, uh, how am I doing on time? Um... We have about 15 minutes to wrap up. Okay, that's very good. That's excellent. Uh, let, let me quickly go through this. So the uh, uh, the point over here is that every aspect of that is subject to innovation. We say that, you know, a lecture is no longer a lecture. It is a six-minute video segment. It is, uh, you know, uh, like we said, this is the online version of the Teal program on MITx, where, you know, where you have on-site activity on, but when you don't understand the concept immediately, you know, you can have a visualization to help you understand that. You have a virtual game like Labor, when you don't understand the concept, this is actually from Anand's course, we can quickly have a, a game like Lab in real time that happens. So suddenly when you look at a course, a lecture is transformed to a six minute video segment where with Without latency, you can have a lab-like experiment to explain the concept that that you just learned. You can do, as you know, a quick set of formative testing at that time, make corrections, like in the case of the Michael T. Mark course. So every aspect of the course, from lectures to credentials, is transformed, right? And one of the things that I like to point out again, going back to my uh, the the slide about the supply side, all the integrated science of learning becomes a very, very important fact in our design of a tech because these things that we're talking about, you know, about short videos, frequent formative testing, you know, retrieval, all these, the design of the course, the technology elements is not happening just because there are toys available, because they're actually informed what, by what we have learned and are learning about learning. The fact that, and this you heard me say many times, that we just don't have learning curves, we have forgetting curves, right? And if you look at the, the, the diagram over here, that when you think about interleaved learning, right? Sorry. When you think about interleaved learning, that recall is much better when you have interleaved learning, right? When you have formative testing and recall is what you want. It's not just the immediate recall, but the downstream recall. And you see that data over there. 
So what that tells you is that the slope of the forgetting curve is reduced through these kinds of practices. So when you have short online video, and so there's a lot of learning science. In fact, what we say is, and this is a very important lesson for EdTech, that EdTech digital technologies allow us to implement what we are learning from learning science about good learning practices, but also allow them to implement them at scale. So going back to Vaishnavi's original example about or so who about about assessment and frequent formative testing, we can't do we can do it to four students, 40 students, but not to 400 students, or with the efficacy that we got right now. And so this informs this is a very important supply side force that goes along with uh, with educational technology with, with our digital learning practice, right? So we actually launched a whole uh, initiative called the Integrated uh, Learning Initiative, which looks at you know cognitive science, you know, uh, behavioral sciences, social sciences. There's a whole field here, discipline-based education research, which even looks at how does active learning manifest itself in teaching of biology science. I would urge you to look at some of the research that is going on. Amina probably has those sources, DBER, very interesting work. But all these inform, and I'm sure your own research is pointing to some of these things. How do I look at learning science and help it to inform the design of my ed tech, the design and implementation of my education technology, right? How, and one of the things that allows me to do with ed tech is judiciously combine on site and online. And that's what we saw when I said, you know, the flipped classrooms, they were using flipped in different ways. You look at different kinds of practices, how might I combine for different contexts for different kinds of learners. So all that leads me to almost say, and look, this, when we look at the new landscape, we saw the old landscape and we saw all those projects and we look at the new landscape. And so you can see some obvious things over here, certainly the increased digitalization, but this demonstrates how, what I was saying, you know, every aspect from lectures to credentials are being subject prone to innovation because of digital centrality, because of a tech, right? Uh, by the way, the, the, in the AI, uh, and I, I have these resources, I'll send this, uh, this slide over. This, I just picked this up at the, at the session I was in day before yesterday. Everyone is thinking about AI in teaching, learning, what are the new possibilities? How can I bring generative AI in teaching, writing, in teaching this? I heard some wonderful examples when I was there at this meeting in your own context over there. So AI certainly is having a very big role. You heard of the day of AI. Uh, this is a program. I think the uh, this screen is got stuck. Uh, I think Chita or some yeah. can you message Vijay and let him know perhaps. Uh, he will he join. He's joining. He's joining the world. Yeah. 
So, uh, Vijay will be joining back, uh, and then we will wrap up this session. If you can just wait for a couple of minutes, yeah. <laughs> Uh, are there any participants today uh, who would uh, who's willing or uh, maybe have any other questions regarding masters in education and technology? Uh, you can raise your hand if you have any if you would like to know more about the program or have any questions. Then we can plan accordingly to stay back the last five, five minutes after Vijay wraps up. You can. Uh, Raise your hand uh, if you would like to stay back to understand the master's program in education and technology, or if you have any questions. Power outage in Boston. It's interesting, man. Stop us. Uh, if uh, the participants have any questions for Vijay, if you can uh, start typing your questions, that will help us go fast when he rejoins.
So I think we would stay back for four more minutes and uh, wait for the gym. Yeah. Okay, Sadaqat has already posted a question which is ready for the gym. I have a question. You want to add in the talk about the phone? And I just want to join. <laughs> in Boston. <laughs> I'm actually reminded of uh, a similar uh, scenario in which uh, uh, and some professors from IIT Bombay were presenting, uh, introducing their software and suddenly <laughs> it was gone. And we got to know that IIT Bombay had this entire network outage. <laughs> I hope it's not the entire MIT. <laughs> Is that At awesome. a point, they were third world problems, but I think the first world countries also face the, the why only India, everyone face the problem. It's the climate change happening uh, across. <laughs> why, why should India have all the fun? <laughs> I think it's also in India, there's this high attitude of adaptability and we are really used to having such things happen and it, you know, a backup kicks in or something or the other, um, we manage. We are, we are the torch bearers of Jugard and life hacks. I know, I know. <laughs> so we know how to deal with that. Probably Vijay is a little new to the game. He's not new to India. That no, no, no. He's not new to India. Probably the power outage has lost touch. It's his ecosystem. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So, this whole question of whether technology will teacher proof our classrooms goes mute. I mean, moot. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. And you can see me now, except that uh, uh, everything went off. So some excitement over here, because I, you know, it's quite possible that, hang on. I think we can only see your jacket, sir. Yeah, no, 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 we can see you. How's that? Is that better? Okay. Yes, it is. Yes. Okay, okay. Good, 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 good. Uh, sorry, folks. Sorry. I, I think it's quite possible that somebody took an axe to some cable over here, or there must have been an accident because everything just went out. The network, all the lights, the power, and uh, um, yeah, and I couldn't switch. Anyway, so this is sort of, you know, what I was saying is when you look at the new landscape over here, you know, you, you see the various kinds of applications. And I just want to touch on uh, a couple. It shows a variety of things, you know, technologies. Uh, you look at uh, uh, AI, virtual reality. Again, it points out that uh, there are innovative possibilities with EdTech across the entire uh, life cycle, you know, the, of learning. And this is just some examples that I wanted to give for instance, and that we are beginning to focus on a lot, certainly uh, you know, virtual reality, not just AI. We've talked about AI, you know, looking at how generative AI might be used uh, effectively. And of course, you know, there are programs like AFI which point to what are some of the challenges. We hear some of the typical challenges, plagiarism, et cetera. But how might we constructively leverage these Again, keeping the problem in mind, how can we learn what we learn better? How can we take learning to those who might be traditionally underserved? In fact, one of the things that you see about uh, uh, chat GPT itself is how it provides a, a good micro world for people who might not have had a lot of preparation 
to pick up skills, uh, skills quickly, you know, to sort of move faster through some early stages of learning, not necessarily deep conceptual learning, but get some quicker understanding of the domain, et cetera, or can, it can be a, a, a sort of an interim accelerator in the case that I mentioned, how it might be used for better metacognition amongst learners, it's looking at AI yeah, in virtual reality. And this is something in teacher prep that various places, including Columbia, for instance, how might we introduce the notion of bias to teachers in pre-service programs, right? And uh, 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 the, uh, you know, and so creating situations like that, this is, this is some very interesting work that's going on. Now, so this is with virtual reality and AR. Now, uh, when I talk about credentials and how the whole offering space has changed, this is a program that I often talk about. We talked about it when I was there. Uh, how many of you are familiar with this program? So you've seen the, the MicroMasters. And essentially you say, look, you know, uh, it's a series of five courses online that anybody can take. And- oh, Vijay, we are unable to see that particular slide. It shows your slides, uh, like a slide grid. Yeah. You're not able to see the slide? No, when take the slide grid, it's slide one to nine on the screen. Oh, really? I'm sharing the, it says screen sharing and. Uh, at the, Vijay, at the bottom. Oh, 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 oh yeah. I see what's happening. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It says, uh, thank you. Feedback is, immediate feedback, feedback is important. Okay. Like I, 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 oh, I know what. Happened. Even now, Vijay. Uh, if I no, may. no, no, no. It won't. It won't. It's showing the wrong uh, slides. In the bottom navigation bar, if you can. No, 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 no. It's uh, because it had opened the wrong uh, slide set. Can you see this now? Yeah, yeah. Yes. So essentially, this MicroMasters program that you see, it's you know a, a series of five courses that it's online. But what's interesting, and people get that they get online credentials, and you know, to the fact that the world around is changing, these online credentials are being accepted when people are employing various industries and adopting it, but. The interesting part of this is for those who might want to get terminal degrees, they can actually go, uh, you know, in, in the case of MIT's courses, come and spend a semester over here. If they are admitted, you know, there are certain conditions about your performance in the online courses or in any of several institutions, you know, around 100 institutions around the world who look at the MicroMasters and you, they say, come and do the semester at my institution and it'll give you a terminal degree from there. So American University of Cairo, in their economics program, people do the online MicroMasters over here. They spend a semester at AUC and get the AUC economics master's degree. So the interesting thing about this, and which speaks to the interest with adult learning and providing continuous learning or upskilling opportunities, it separates out. And this is one of the opportunities that digital and ed tech brings, if you start rethinking the whole process, it says, look, you know, I do not have to get admitted to an institution in order to learn. You know, all these kinds of modular offerings, different kinds of certified offerings that I can take. And I have a range of credentialing opportunities. I can get online credentials. If I want, I can go get a terminal degree. So this dissociation, the structural dissociation of the institute from learning, from credential, suddenly it opens up a whole bunch of combinatorials of learning opportunities. And that's the way, you know, to think about education technology, about what are new possibilities. Because I mean, we've talked about this in India a lot. You, know? you cannot build an institution a day in order, or a school a day to meet the demand 
of all the learners that are there can I come up with different kinds of possibilities. Again, design condition. I cannot compromise on quality. I have to rethink quality. I have to rethink how can I leverage community, institutions, digital, in order to provide these kinds of, that's, I think, the problem and the opportunity for, for, uh, for ed tech, right? So accordingly, and again, this is when I said, you, when you think about ed tech, digital technologies, you say learning to credentials, you have to create enablers. So we created, you know, when you talk about digital credentials, you have modular, you're talking about micro credentials and digital credentials. You start looking at their interoperability initially through some out of band agreements between institutions, but you create platforms also where exchange of credentials is possible. So there's this whole digital credential consortium initiative that's been created now, it's running well. So this is the new landscape, the new phase. These are elements of the new landscape, the new phase of digital learning, of educational technology, if you will. Uh, I mentioned this, uh, you know, when I was talking about AI, is a program that I talk about a lot because I work with these folks also and we've been using them. Essentially, again, this speaks to providing new pathways, new possibilities. So the GAN, uh, AI platform, uh, imagine that you have your transcripts, you have your LinkedIn profile, you have your resume, and what the platform allows you to do is extract. It's almost like essay grading, which is what this was doing earlier on. And uh, it allows, it grocks your competencies, your current state. On the other side, we know from many sources, what are the skills and competencies that are needed for various jobs in the labor market. In between, you have courses, content, et cetera. And what the platform allows you to do is to create different pathways between the competencies that you have and the competencies that you need to achieve. You know, so here are content aggregations, thematic bundles of content, learning pathways that can be created to get from here to there. So these are the kinds of ed tech possibilities that are being created right now. And by the way, when, when I say, it grocks your competencies from your resume, from your transcripts, et cetera. It is no different from applying a rubric on an essay answer to see if you got the concepts. In fact, that's what it was being used for originally. So AI being used, and this is an increasingly popular use where you say, look, before we used to just do testing, even the frequent formative testing on Likert scales, and you know, yes, no kind of answers. How about for essay grading? And it's being used effectively. And I will tell you a dirty little secret. The first time when we were trying it, it was doing better than human graders. So you have a question there, Saurabh, I see. Uh, sir, uh, I really like the idea of these mezzanine courses that uh, you were mentioning above. Uh, that's a good way out. I definitely support that idea. But somewhere I also have the strong feeling that uh, that dilutes the seriousness of the course or of the very the the, the very study sometime i'm not saying it uh, happens every single time but if i am reducing the uh, the course to a a lower level course or i am bringing it down just so that it is more accessible it is more uh, accessible to a, to a uh, to bigger uh, a lot of people mm -hmm. but uh, i also feel that the that dilutes the seriousness no, because sorry, is... i'm going to quickly interject and uh, first argue back but you've raised a very important question so uh, i would not make the assumption of dilute diluting these are online mit courses yes these are courses that our students take yes. they're not going to dilute courses right so no it takes no no wait let me finish yeah. so, so, sorry. so it takes a long time no that's okay it takes a long time to approve a micro masters for exactly the reason, because you said, no, nah, this has got to be thing. But you raise a, and so the, and that's why when people are hiring, the marketplace votes with their feet. Who are your, what's your evidence that this is working? Two, mm. we ourselves are saying, we're going to give you credit for what you took online to mm. admit it to into our master's program. Mm. Okay, so there's that. The marketplace is saying, I'm going to hire you because look, I'm seeing that you got the same things that we want. Okay, we don't have the degree, but 
in supply chain management, these dimensions you've got there. Okay, now to your point, so we don't have dilution, but you raise a very, very important this thing. And we've seen this, this happen with MOOCs, MicroMasters, et cetera. We, and with open content, the example that I give in, uh, again, in the mid 2000s, you know, there was a next generation learning challenge project by the Gates Foundation, right? And we had a whole bunch of community colleges. Our proposition was education in the US was very expensive because the cost of textbooks were very prohibitive, right? We said you have to use open content, open text, and the price will go down. So a set of institutions, 11 community colleges, agreed, their provost agreed to use only open resources, right? Well, and we looked at it. It was great, except there was one problem. The people who had to access the courses, they said, oh yeah, it's great, you got great math courses. I need remedial math. I need remedial reading so that I can understand those courses. So just making it available was not enough. But the point is, you can have these online courses of very high quality, and because there is no entrance barrier, okay, you will have a responsibility to increase the likelihood of success of those who come in. Okay, which is why this whole notion of gateway courses, can I, so people will say, if you need to succeed in this course, you need the Alana Falana prerequisites, et cetera, or go to Khan Academy, do this, go so-and-so, do that. We have this course over here and prescribe. Now, you as a TIS faculty member might say, look, uh, for us, we recommend the following courses that we offer that you do these as gateway courses in order to be successful with this MicroMasters. You have that responsibility. You can't take, but I would, I don't say dilute because this is, you know, you, that's the whole, you 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 uh, disqualify your first value, I mean, your first design consideration if you say dilute. Okay, and again, this goes back to the whole notion. You can have great access without diminishing quality. You can have great quality without proportionate increase in cost. That's no longer an immutable triangle. Yeah. And, that non-immutability is created, or mutability is created through a tech and through this notion of open. Sure, sure. Thank you very much. No, it's a, it's a very good point, very, very good point. But we have to be very careful because this is what happened with, a, this is what discredited the online education thing. Yeah. I think it, it is, it, it, the onus lies on the designer and the author of the course uh, and how they, the institution that is offering the course bears the uh, responsibility for how serious the course gets and how, as you said, the likability of the success uh, should yeah. be the should be more sensible to the market. Yeah, yeah. It's very, very rigorous. I mean, I, I, I'll tell you, with Algorir in this thing, we, were, we got delayed with the Data Science MicroMasters they were very interested in that. I was making a, a presentation to our International Advisory Council uh, at MIT. And suddenly, uh, Krishna, who was the chair of the faculty, says, will I go back to that slide one second? I was showing a data science micromasters. He says, you have the data science masters. I said, yeah, that's the intent. He says, but we have not approved it, okay? And I, I did some quick dancing and things like that. I said, yeah, yeah, I know that. But the point is that it takes, it took forever because people, you know, the uh, uh, current com committee on the undergraduate curriculum, the committee on the graduate curriculum, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of governance and oversight before a course gets called a course. Because to, to borrow a very bad term from Microsoft, we have to eat our own dog food, right? So I mean, you know, make sure because the, our students are going to be taking that. You know, so what you put out is not yeah, you know, yeah, and this is all for the rest of the world. You know? But uh, those are very important considerations. Mm -hmm. Sure. In fact, sure. A, a large part of discrediting of edtech happened because you know of this, and which is why, particularly in, I noticed this in middle in the Middle East, there was a lot of pushback against online and digital, particularly, you know, education ministries typically handle K through 12. You know? They did not want digital technology and online anywhere near K through 12. 
for the longest time because there were lots of fly-by-night operators. They were worried that their ability to control quality or to monitor quality would be diminished. I think uh, Vaishnavi has a point uh, about the same thing. She has a message. Go ahead, Vaishnavi. Yeah, I was kind of hooked on to your point about how textbooks are expensive and thereby um, usage of uh, technology makes them more accessible in terms of reducing that cost, right? And I was just thinking that of uh, in, in, in mostly all our discussions, we look at technology as causing a digital divide and um, being a little expensive for people to access. I wonder what other such use cases could be there where technology could actually reduce costs. Uh, in, I can definitely see ways in which it increases access, but um, this I, this particular example of reducing cause, costs, mm -hmm. I'm kind of... Yeah, well, it's um, an interesting question. Uh, I mean, often, I mean, my stock answer is uh, if you, uh, if you, I mean, there are two things. One is I, I noticed that when I came in, Juga was being talked about, you know. I mean, you can come up with innovative, low cost solutions for the technology, but that's one thing. But I think the big cost is in the cost through commoditization and amortization. So when the technology gets commoditized and if you design, like in the case of India on mobile technologies, mobile phones, cell phones, you know, so there's that. And the amortization is where there might be high investment upfront, but a gazillion users, learners are benefiting, right? So there are, there's that, which, what is the atomic, what is the unit cost given so many learners are now benefiting from it. That's the way to look at cost, not just the initial cost, right? How the cost gets amortized for lots and lots and lots of users. And then a third thing with even upfront cost with education, and you know, I mean, we are not looking at ROI, you know, alone. You have to look at VOI. What is the value on investment on having an? So if I'm a policymaker, you know, I'm looking at, uh, you know, what is the value on investment of a literate society of an educated society, right? In and then this is how policymakers follow. I mean, uh, what, what is the impact on the fact that you're more, many more gainfully employed, that you're able to lead the country or the world in different directions, but that you're being able to respond much more uh, aggressively to climate challenges, not to energy challenges, energy consciousness. What is the value of an educated populace? I remember just very quickly when last, you know, my dad used to work for public sector undertakings when, you know, the, the, my late dad. And as a kid, I used to argue with him, you know, I said, say, you know, about public undertakings, you know, I look at private industry, they do make so much profit, they're so efficient, et cetera. And I remember my dad telling me that public sectors initially, that profit was not their motive, you know, raising the industrial base and providing employment was a large part of the reasons that public sector undertakings were created in this thing. So this is like a balanced scorecard. What is the value on investment that you get from making education opportunity much more available? So these are ways of thinking about cost. And again, the open movement was saying, can I you know, share openly? You have, someone has to invest to make sure that content is produced make sure that content is made. And also somebody has to think about, uh, I mean, when open courseware was launched, you know, the society, we had to think about what is the role of publishers, traditional publishers in the open world? Because you can't just say, oh, oh we'll eat their lunch. No, what are the value added services they can provide on college created content? Colleges might be great, academic institutions, great at creating content the first time around. They're not very good at maintaining it, running it, making sure that it's available on different kinds of operating systems. Industry might have a role in sustaining and extending that content. So having that kind of an ecosystem perspective also is, uh, so thinking, uh, you know, what will 
So open might bring in the, bring down the cost to the learner, but to make sure that it's a viable alternative for providing large scale education, there are other considerations that you have to A tech policy, that's why it's, it, it's non trivial. You know, it's not just coming up with the next cute application. And then all the stuff that you all work, I know Amina does a lot of work on, you know, how can you make sure that, you know, teachers actually get comfortable and use it in imaginative and productive ways so that it's not used. You know, I mean, in the, in, with AI, we talk about that a lot now. You know? How can I make sure that teachers use AI as a companion, not as a crutch? How, how, how do you make sure learners use it as a companion, not as a crutch? Okay, so that, so, you know, that's sort of the, yeah, this is again to my point, you know, in light of all this thinking about who is the new learner, what does new teacher look like, you know, and I can delve on these examples much more. I, I you know, I sometimes I create, make this analogy about the, the modern day teacher being like a modern day pilot, having all kinds of data you know, on the student, on learning practices, on page turning behavior, on learning outcomes, and then being able to guide the learner successfully in different conditions, in different contexts. Sort of like how a modern day pilot does with airlines. How do I land the plane safely, knowing having runway data, weather data, passenger data, technical data. Of course, now we like to say in the US, as long as the doors don't fly off Boeing aircrafts, <laughs> how do I land the plane successfully? So this, so if you look at the old, this is my final part, and I'd like you to think hard about. I, I mean, you started off saying that education technology is not new. And we also said that there are important gaps, issues, profound problems that can, it provides great opportunity. There are a whole bunch of considerations. But if you think about what's different now from then, I showed you the slide about the context and there are many things similar, but of course, you know, we had COVID, certainly that's different, it shook the thing. The thing that I see, we were doing a lot of education technology, it's moved from the edge to the center. Suddenly it is central to how we design, develop, distribute educational learning experiences. So the edge to the center, it's a very, very profound. That's why the, this topic of education technology, the field that you're engaging in is so, so vital. Okay. And then there are some of these other kinds of things you know, we, we talked about where you know, it, suddenly it says that, look, learning you know, can be anywhere, can be multiple. Therefore, attend to the learning needs of learners who might be differently motivated, differently prepared, you know, people who have different kinds of abilities, whether they are, you know, vision impairment or math disability. It allows you to come up with different strategies through being able to employ, like I said, judicious combinations of technology and, and you know, old practice. For me, the big thing is also that, and we all engage in this, is this whole business about continuous learning opportunities, which are all experiencing, which are all doing. Uh, the fact is, and this goes back to Vaishnavi's point about students going, they're learning their own, whether through Google, is we have to contend that the new learner, a lot of autonomous learning is happening. They're finding resources, they're finding contacts, they're finding community. And we have to look at what does that mean for shaping learning experiences? given that you're dealing with a whole new ecosystem. So that's, that's uh, those are my uh, thoughts for the morning. You've provoked a lot of thinking. Uh, I'm happy to take more questions or follow up at another time. I'll leave it up to Amina, Suchita, and you all to determine what you want to do. I can't, I can't hear you very clearly. 
yeah. Can you hear me, Vijay? Yes, I can hear you, Amina. <laughs> so thank you so much, Vijay. I think this was uh, really great. Uh, it, it was really music. <laughs> At least my ear just wanted to keep hearing. A lot of gyan, I think we have got. Um, uh, I think some of the concepts that you started with and, you know, the way it uh, kind of uh, went through, I think this is very, very uh, uh, evolutive. It is very, very uh, contemporary. And I think we should definitely do a second session sometime, uh, especially with the students. Or I think uh, this was very powerful. Maybe we can speak later of even converting your today's seminar into a small course or a seminar course. Um, uh, oh, I'd love that. We should talk about that. I'd love that. Especially looking at some of the kinds of questions and discussions, you know. Uh, sure. I think that is will be very, very helpful. We'll touch base on that. But thank you for all your generosity and the time and the knowledge. I think this was very, very useful. And uh, we look forward to take this uh, uh, beyond this uh, small uh, two-hour presentation. And despite all the challenges, I think uh, we had a very good session. And the way Vijay wanted, I think he wanted interactive. And I know only a few people could interact, but it was very meaningful. So thank you all. Um, uh, we can- uh, My pleasure, get... my pleasure. I'm yeah. sorry about the power outage, but then, you know, acts of God. Yeah, we had a very good discussion while you were away about the power outage in Boston. Yeah. I, I, I've noticed, you know, that most of the time, the best thing I can do is get out of the way. <laughs> so thank you so much. Uh, My pleasure. Be well, guys. We shall see you. Hope thank you, Vijay. Wonderful to listen to you. Yeah, yeah see you guys. Recording with your permission and share with the participants also. Okay, great. I'll do that, yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Take care. Thank you, Vijay. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye. We'll see you around. Thank you, sir. Thanks. It was a wonderful Thank session. You, Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. It was a really thought-provoking session. session. Thank you all. I'm making my great way to start my morning. Looking forward for another interaction, sir. Thank you welcome, very welcome. much. Yes, very same here. Take care, guys. Bye.